afterward. So we made sure that the templates were customizable and students could add their own notes and sort of make their own story. Uh, and finally, uh, we, like most of the students said, and also experienced that uh, making assignments in Dropbox is something that's more appealing to them as compared to a traditional writing and essay assignment. Um, finally, for our soft, soft presentation, we had a couple of professors come in and play our game. And two of the most important takeaways was, like, as our tool is still a prototype, it's not complete. Uh, we do not have a tutorial, so it was really important to guide them and give them explicit directions as to what to click on, where to go. Uh, and uh, next it was, like, we had a couple of uh, UI UX polish uh, feedback that with the time that we had, we sort of refined those. Uh, now I would like to call upon Lynn to talk about teacher surveying. Thank you. So in our survey with teachers, um, we did 30 minutes uh, interviews with five teachers across six subjects. So uh, most teachers think our tool would work best with subjects like um, foreign language, creative writing, and statistics. So from the teacher survey, we have discovered some takeaways that can improve our tool. So in order to um, make our tool more useful for teachers to give assignments, we have discovered that these three features can help us to adjust the use of our temp uh, dialogue templates, which are the class subjects, the difficulty level of these assignments, and how teachers want to grade the assignments. So, uh, we found, additionally, we found out that most teachers think our tool is more appreciated towards middle school instead of high school, mostly due to high school's time, uh, tight time lim limitations on their curriculum. And most teachers do not think our tool can be scalable across all subjects. More teachers are uh, enthusiastic towards subjects like foreign language and creative writing, and teachers are most worried about the use in math and history. So that's why we decided to shift our uh, subject focus from history to language, because in history, uh, we found out that it's hard to portray the complex historical nuances and it's too sensitive for Dropbox. After we shift our subject focus to foreign language, we found out uh, that the aesthetic and historical accuracy matter less, so that leaves more space for students' creativity. Students can have more freedom to create their dialogue and environment, and it also can help them to practice their skills in vocabulary and grammar. And lastly, we have the access to reach out to a, foreign lang a Latin teacher, which is in high school right now, who can provide us some Latin assignments that we can use to text our tool. Then I'll pass to you to talk about documentation. So as we mentioned before, documentation became a really important part of our project this semester. And so our really extensive documentation includes a lot, of, a lot about our design, playtesting, and teacher surveying insights, some technical documentation on the back end of our product, um, tool instructions on how to explicitly use our tool, a log of all the art that our artists created, a postmortem of the design process, and a bunch of next steps for, Ro for Roblox to follow up on. So as an example of what, this, what some of these insights might be, we have a bunch of potential challenges with our tool that we think is important to address. And so some of these include that like, making infinitely larger dialogue trees is possible and confusing. Um, school districts have to approve Roblox on their Wi-Fi and school-owned devices. Um, teachers have to, take, have to take on the burden of moderating content. There's also a steep learning curve for our tool, and scenes and dialogue can take a lot of time to grade. So for next steps for Roblox, for example, we would recommend that they complete some complete features that we didn't get to. They would add and, or add and organize the, to the asset drawer, kind of like a, what Alice 3 has. Polish and refine the dialogue system by including undo delete buttons and arrows to show directionality, as well as, as, well as seek out further teacher advice. So in summary, we're making an educational tool for narrative design built in Roblox Studio. We're including a demo of how this tool could be used, as well as a documentation with insights, um, next steps, challenges, and guidelines of use. Thank you, we're now open to questions. Yes, Ralph. In the, in the dialogue tree, is there a, a word limit? So, yeah, so Ralph's question was, is there a word limit in the dialogue tree? Um, so there's not a word limit in the dialogue tree, but there is like, a, it wraps, and so once you, 
So currently, if you like write too much, you just can't see what else you're writing in the tree. And that's actually one of the recommendations that we have for Roblox is to kind of extend the dialogue nodes so that they get larger with more text there is. Yes? So um, during playtest days when we had kind of the most middle school access, because Roblox was interested in high schoolers, um, specifically that's what we playtested most with and talked the most with teachers. Um, as far as the seven to 18 year olds, that is Roblox's age range. Their target for us was high schoolers and some of the teacher feedback was like, we don't necessarily think this is for high schools. It's high schoolers, we think it'd work better for middle schooler. And when approached, like when we brought this up to Roblox, they wanted to continue developing for high schoolers. So that's definitely part of the process, and that's kind of where we recommend teachers implement templates too, is that they can provide sort of templates that are either like partially filled or in some ways blank for students to complete on paper and then move into our like tool. Um, it's kind of, it's something that we, like, we would recommend and we noticed that a lot of students do, but there were certainly some students who were like, I don't need to do that and were able to create like perfectly fine conversations without that process. It could also be, that is also a way that we discuss with the teacher and how they can like alleviate some of the grading stresses is if they do it on paper first, it's easier to grade on paper and then students can actually use the experience between themselves. So for one of our play tests, we filled uh, one part for the NPC and then let the students fill the part for their character. So yes, we kind of, we recommend doing that. We recommend teacher doing that. And uh, we also have like other characters that are themed. So it's kind of prompt in a way. One thing too is that this is a tool for teachers to use and so the burden of creating prompts is sort of on them for that because we can't cr necessarily create universal prompts for classes. So an example of a, like one of the prompts was with the Latin assignment, write 10, 10 sentences with using 10 vocabulary words and then providing all the vocabulary words. All right, thanks team. Thank everybody, thanks everybody. Uh, hi, we're Team Roblox X. Um, this is our team. Our uh, client is also Roblox. So um, this semester, uh, we're researching on assessment method inside Roblox, and our deliverable including uh, two Roblox prototypes based on history and physics. Uh, we also have three documents, uh, one is for the assessment and two for the design documents. 
uh, our goal including um, find the assessment method fitting Roblox and also making ro prototypes to prove the assessment. Our final goal is also giving feedback to Roblox for a better user experience. And our demographic, in including uh, educational developers, there will be the people who look into our documents. And our uh, target audience for the uh, th uh, prototypes are the uh, middle school students who play Roblox. Uh, for the durable, we have decided to have the client requirement, uh, design documentation, and uh, assessment effectiveness as our metrics. Um, at the early of this semester, we are research searching on the uh, existing educational games, and also we talk to teachers about the traditional assessment method in classroom, and um, the most important part is we are researching on the evidence center design. And um, the, for the people who are not familiar with this concept, so evidence center, center design including one uh, competency model, evidence model, and test model. Um, it's instead of using quizzes, uh, it's using data tracking to get the student learning. Um, based on the research we have done, we have our own evidence center design structure, which we will talk about later. So as I mentioned, data tracking is an important part of the Everson design. So I will hand on to Jennifer to talk about the data tracking in our demos. Yeah, hi. So for assessment purpose, we need data tracking methods for online play testers. So at first, we decide to use third party analysis to track the data. However, things like Google Analytics has some problems, such as it can only access the data in real time or after 24 hours, and that is not suitable for our own purpose. Therefore, we developed our own data tracking system inside Roblox. As you can see, this is our process. First, we have a built-in data system inside using Lua table and data store service inside Roblox Studio, and then passing it to other HTTP server, for example, Discord. And then we can virtualize the data using other tools. This system allows developers easily customize their own data tracking too. Now let's have our designers to introduce our two game prototypes. Uh, okay, so let me introduce our physics prototype first. Uh, so the reason why we choose physics is because in real life, uh, it's hard to create an ideal experiment uh, for students. But in virtual world, we can get the support from game engine and also uh, we can use physics to explore the possibilities uh, for other science-related subjects. And uh, so at the beginning, we uh, started with some classical uh, physical rules uh, because they're based on textbook and easy to find the learning standard. But finally, we choose some real life scenarios is because they're more practical and the student can apply the knowledge to real life. So our final topic is friction and also the difference between sliding friction and rolling friction. Uh, so this is uh, basically the gameplay of our, of our project. And players need to push down the object to the ramp, down the ramp and make sure this object can reach to the target area. Uh, and during this process, players can change the friction of the ground. Uh, so the process of our iteration is like, so at the beginning we have the level one and level two to be the introduction level to introduce the gameplay of friction. And then we have level three and four to be the comparison levels to inspire students to think more about the friction and also our gameplay. And then we have level five and six to be the interference level to help us understand if players have no the knowledge of friction and also our gameplay. So this is the basic structure of our assessments we mentioned before. So let me break it down and show some details. Uh, so as you can see, the first part is competency model. So our core knowledge is friction. And also we have different parts of friction, the sliding friction and rolling friction. Uh, so the second one is our task model. So we have six levels to be our task, and also we will track players' behavior during the process of playing to be the evidence. And then the evidence model we have is also the process of data analysis and data tracking. So as you can see, this is the final template we have uh, of our collected data. So we will use the data like this to do the data analysis. Uh, so for example, in level one and two, we will pay more attention to the finish time because we can compare the finish time and know if uh, they have understand uh, the basic gameplay of friction. 
And then in level three and four, we will pay more attention to increase times and decrease times. By, compare, uh, com by comparing the increase times and decrease times, we will know uh, if they have already understand uh, the, some high level knowledge about the friction. And in level five and six, uh, students are only required to change the friction of the box instead of the bar. But at the same time, we will track the bar increase times and bar decrease times to make sure they have understand uh, the difference between sliding friction and rolling friction. Uh, so next part is about our assessment standard. Uh, so ideally, we should find a certain group of students who have passed the official exams for the knowledge we want to assess. But what we did right now is just complete a simple quiz about the knowledge we want to assess because we cannot find enough students who have known uh, the friction uh, very best. And then after that, we will compare the result of the exam and then uh, with the data we collected to build our assessment standard. So this is a final version of our assessment standard. So as you can see, we define what is not mastered, what is mastered, and what is proficient. So for more information and details about this assessment standard, uh, please check out our document. So let's introduce our his history part. Hi, I'm Tao, and now I'll talk about our history prototype. So first, to start, um, why history? First, uh, it's because we want to cover more grounds to so that we pick a subject that's very distinct in uh, physics. We also want to discover what we can do with uh, narrative, co uh, narrative concepts and a physical engine. And we are hoping that we can find a universal solution for subjects such as history, economics, and psychology. So um, first, show um, our demo. Uh, our gameplay is simple. Player will be able, able to check um, the description of these nodes in uh, the game world. These nodes represent historical, uh, historical concepts or events. And what players are doing is by uh, changing the direction of the laser uh, to reform uh, their relationship and to connect them. So um, each of our level are uh, guided by a mind map. Um, so these are mind maps of um, history uh, subjects. So for now, uh, for our demo, we used um, European exploration. And um, you can see at first the level is um, in the wrong layout, and then players will have to connect, them, uh, connect the nodes into the correct order and, um, and relationship. So um, for our entire game, we have a bigger mind map that we're using. And for the levels, we're using floating islands and portals, some elements that kids really like as our guiding ideas so that kids know where they're going when they're playing our experience. So for the assessment of history, we're using competition, uh, I mean repetition of combination as our um, key assessment methods. We'll be showing the same connection multiple times and we'll assess them by um, whether, uh, so we use the first time as the education, like teaching process, and then we use the following times as assessment process. So we check whether the player actually understand the concept by changing the consistency of whether, uh, how they're doing with the same uh, connection and nodes. So for the current uh, history project, we're more focused on the iteration and findings we have, um, and we have them all in our document. So the current history project will have a lot of noise to data collection, and we need to separate more whether um, the students are confused by the mechanics or the knowledge that we're teaching. As students right now are, um, are like finding it hard to get past level three. So we did a lot of iterations, and we have included a lot of these in our document. Uh, the iteration including some uh, of our, tr our attempts in solving uh, brute forcing and prevent students from uh, breaking the levels. And we also did some finding with our, uh, did some uh, experience with our structure. There are also some findings that we found really exciting, such as, um, such as multiplayer mode. Um, we tried to turn on the multiplayer settings one time for our players, and it turned out really exciting. Um, kids were actively discussing with each other, and they assigned themselves really uh, roles automatically. And we've included some of these findings in our documents as well. Here is something that we wish uh, we, that we could be what we could could have done, such as um, we want to experience more with the arrow and flow of our events, and we want to uh, experience with our relation nodes, and we want some more playtests with the multiplayer. And I'll pass it to Haiyun to talk about our playtest. Yeah. So for playtest, 
um, we adopted Think Cloud and the uh, survey and interview um, to mainly test the um, assessment, assessment uh, effectiveness, effectiveness and playability, and also seek for suggestions from uh, educators. Um, we designed two uh, surveys and uh, for each demo and include quiz-like questions in each survey. And here's a, a historic uh, history example. Uh, if the students could answer the uh, questions right, that means they mastered uh, this knowledge. And we um, compare these uh, results with um, with our data, uh, with their performance in the game to better build our data metrics for uh, the mastery level. And we have five playtests uh, in total. The first is ETC playtest day, and three playtests with Mellon Middle School and one with Highlands Middle School. Uh, so besides their contributions to our game iteration and uh, data collection, here are some valuable high-level findings from our students. The first is kids definitely love Roblox, even if it's an um, educational game. So we can see it from their passion that there's a great opportunity to have games um, as learning and assessment methods in class. And second is uh, students continue to play our games even after our playtest session um, from like uh, by reviewing our data collection bot uh, that uh, means our game is um, replayable. And third is students tend to work together even uh, we design single player uh, games that we can see a um, possibility of multiplayer mode here. And with the interview with, with our educators, um, here are some suggestions from our teachers. The first is with um, history teacher. He thinks the mechanic seems solid while the contents could be replaceable. And again, the multiplayer mode. Um, also, um, Scott says, um, if we want to like make our games more replayable, we'd better have the um, levels randomized. And also a praise from the instructor from Milo, Madden Middle School. He thinks the students bought in our game and they won with us. Uh, then Joy will talk about some general discoveries. Thank you. So in the past 14 weeks, we have a lot of interesting findings. So it is there's a lot of similarity and also a lot of difference to our physical uh, physics game and also history game because they are different. One is more science driven. Uh, the other one is more text driven. And also we find that since uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, Roblox are accessible to most device, so there's a lot of content that school cannot control, so they block the access to any school device right now. So we suggest have a filter or better content controlling system so that the uh, educator can use that for a better uh, tool for them. And also, uh, since there's a lot of, uh, already a close connection between Roblox and student, it is a lot easier for us to build a connection between our products to uh, our target audience. And also 67% of the, uh, the user for Roblox is, is under the age of 16. And also educator we've been talking to has also been uh, bought in the idea of using Roblox as a teaching tool. And for us, a lot of things we want to improve, one is playability and also assessment uh, and better way to evaluate and visualize our data. And also we want to polish our gameplay and our UI UX so that students can have a better experience and have a better, uh, better way of learning to, through our products. And to summarize, we are building two prototypes, in introducing assessment method into Roblox, and also our developer including to document to uh, including all of our process in an iteration uh, along with our data and findings. Thank you all, we are opening for questions. This one, uh, yeah. So we, uh, so our effective final effective data are just ten students. So uh, during the process of our iteration, I mean the play, iteration of play test, uh, we polished about our uh, survey and also our game. So 
based on the results of uh, our survey and also the data we collected during the process of playing our game. So we built this uh, table. Like, uh, we have uh, three different questions about the uh, friction. Uh, if they can answer them uh, correctly for both of them, uh, they can have a profi uh, proficient and uh, we can compare this student results with the data we collected and then build uh, the numbers here. And we also have interviews, um, so we are combine all the uh, data we collect. Yeah. Uh, two parts. Um, y how much did you create the curriculum? Uh, what do you mean by curriculum? Uh, the topics to be taught. Um, no, uh, we found teaching standards online and then we use a lot of it as our guideline. All right, so yeah. you sort of borrowed some of the curriculum. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so my second question is about the assessment. Did you find that you had to change the curriculum to fit the assessment model, or what was the feedback loop between the way you assessed the students and the curriculum itself? Um, we didn't really have to change the assessment for the curriculum, but um, rather change the game design um, and level design to fit like our assessment more. And um, we also picked part of the um, the curriculum that fit into like games, because we want as like for example for the physics demo we can't really test, and we don't want to test something like that is too mathematical. We don't want them to, um, we, don't, we don't want them to um, answer questions about like our, uh, algorithms. So we're teaching the general concept instead of. Um, the math behind it. So was there, general question, was there much collaboration between your team and the other Roblox team? Uh, uh, no. In what, <laughs> why? We have the same client. Yeah, but so between you two got, between you two teams, you didn't go back and forth discussing? Oh, uh, we actually have some small talk which, uh, separately with, with other, uh, like our team members, but the things like we're researching on different topics, so our project are, uh, are not, technically are not related, yeah. So we're more focused on the assessment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we did share information, but we- Yeah, we have shared information, but not on the similar project, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello everyone. We're Team Jello Plate, and our product is Jello Creature Lab. So, at the beginning of this semester, we were asked by our client Diploco to design a broadly accessible at home experience that uses Jello for a tool for um, bonding time play while appealing to multiple senses. And after several rounds of brainstorming and iteration, we finally came up with our answer, which is bring your Jello monster to life together with your family. And this is our product video, which includes a playthrough of the whole game. Hello there. My name is Dr. Jello. Why is this muted? Hello there. My name is Dr. Gelatin. Welcome to Jello Monsters AR. Jello Monsters AR is developed by Jello Play, a team at Carnegie Mellon's Entertainment Technology Center, in collaboration with Deep Local, an award winning creative agency. First, open the Jello Monster kit. You can make different colors of Jello sheets using the colors provided. Remember, ask your parents for help when preparing the Jello sheets. 
Your parents will be your professional assistants in your kitchen laboratory. Once the jello sheets are prepared, cut out a unique shape that you want your monsters to have on the large plate of red jello and scan using the Jello Monster AR app. In no time, the monster's body will appear on the screen. Isn't that magical? You can give your little creature eyes and mouths. We have many kinds of looks for you, so go crazy with decorating your little monster. <laughs> now try feeding the monster. Cut out fun shaped jigglers using the different jello colors and see it react to different types of emotions. Lastly, take a photo with your unique beloved monster. You can take one with yourself and the monster, or even with your parents included. Are you ready for this one-of-a-kind experience with your yellow creature? Yeah, that is our product. And as you saw in the video, we designed a package for customers, which including uh, like all the stuff you need to experience our game. And this includes um, uh, four element cards, several packs of gelatin and a plastic knife, um, a QR code to download our game, and then um, some instructions printed inside our box. And for our game, we designed two phases, which is customizing and feeding. And now you can see the customizing um, interfaces where kids will scan the jello and spawn the jello monster's buddy, and then they will tap on the buddy to attach eyes and mouths on it. And for the feeding part, um, kids will use those four element cards to determine which color of jello should they use to feed the monster. And the monster will act differently uh, when triggered um, different uh, emotions. And now I'm gonna hand it to Sarah. Thanks, John. So, how did we meet the goals? So to check off the client's list, we had three main experience goals. First was making sure that the product was an integration of the physical and the digital experience, so that we're reflecting deep locals' practice and their products. Second, because the client in our scenario was Jello, we wanted to make sure that the experience is branded around Jello and its unique features. And lastly, making sure to orient the hybrid experience around family, which we defined it as a parent and a child. And this is our final uh, experience package, and the parent and the child will purchase this box together to begin the experience. The hybrid nature of Deep Local's product is reflected by combining the play with the jello in the kitchen, and then bringing that jello over to a simple narrative-based mobile game powered by um, AR technology. And as seen in the video earlier, the transition from the physical to the digital happens when the family makes the jello body in the physical space, and then they scan the shape over to the digital space um, where they can interact with the branded creature in multiple different ways. And Jello Creature Lab also puts the family into role play um, where the kid is the creator and the parent is the assistant. So it thus promotes communication and collaboration between the child and the parent throughout the entire experience. Now I'll pass it off to Nancy. Yeah. Um, so we have integrated a simple storyline throughout the experience. So um, firstly, the kids and the parents will meet Dr. Gelatin, and he is going to be the guidance throughout the gameplay from the physical lab setting, which is our kit, uh, all the way until the AR uh, space. So uh, they will, uh, he will guide the family like from making the Jello to uh, playing the game and until the ending where it will create a mental for the users of a picture. And then we have our design system, so it creates a consistency throughout our uh, play. So this um, UI design is uh, inspired by the Jello color palette as well as the texture of Jello, and it unifies the visual looks of the 2D and 3D um, assets. So on the right here, we have the mockups of how uh, these elements look in the AR setting. And then we have our playtests and iterations. So uh, during midterm, we hosted the playtest of uh, three 
uh, 30 kids coming to uh, playtest our core game mechanism. And these are the three main uh, insights and iterations we have from that um, playtest. So firstly, we have changed from uh, a, tab a tablet-based game into a phone game. So, because we found that there are a lot of like uh, difficulty when children are holding the iPads, uh, it might be too heavy for them, so we change it on a phone to ease the process. And secondly, we have focused more on the magic moment of uh, customization of the monsters. So uh, we had a lot of iterations. For example, like on the right here, our original mechanism is that they will scan uh, the components of um, the jello uh, and then like it will place it on uh, the jello monster body. And we found that uh, it actually adds user frictions and also make the visuals not that consistent. So from that uh, experience, we have uh, made a pre-made um, component library with vivid animations so they can directly place it on the Jello monster to make the visuals more exciting. And lastly, we have um, used that experience to brainstorm our further um, experience and how to take it um, into the net. Next step. So uh, we understand the needs and wants from the uh, kids. So mainly, um, like they want more, like uh, the Jello will talk or fly, or like they can pet the Jello. So we have integrated their um, answers from our interviews into um, developing and designing our further experience. Yeah, and then we all move to tech. Next, I will introduce the implementation and iterations from tech perspective. So first, it's about how to emphasize the hybrid experience, which leads us to the question about how to convert 2D image to 3D mesh. We finished our first attempt before halves, which is based on this image processing, draw triangles, and extrude. Well, this method didn't really work well in our playtest day, since the breaking mesh problem is happening a lot. To solve this problem, we came up with another solution based on the convex tile algorithm. This algorithm ensures the completeness of the mesh. However, the shape will look less similar than the physical jello. So we have to make a choice. Do we really want a perfect mesh, or we can accept accurate shape, but maybe not that perfect? We finally choose the accurate shape to ensure the uniqueness of each monster's body. And we refined our first method. Now 80% of measures look very similar as the physical jello. And this method also is easily reused in the feeding phase to generate the jello food. Our second key challenge is how to implement the unique jello features into the physical digital jello monster's body. And with the soft body motion, the normal recalculation, we get this key feature of jiggling effect done before halves. Without rigging, our Jello monster's body animation is completely done by code. So this jiggling effect not only helps to make the Jello mesh look more like Jello, but also help to improve the visual performance of those simple animations. Third, we also complete the color recognition for Jello's colorful features, supporting the story of feeding monsters with different color of Jellos related to different emotions. Our third challenge is how to interact with this Jello monster. The first version of interactions is based on drag and drop for customization and hand tracking for feeding. However, during the playtest, we found out that the drag and drop interactions is really hard to actually attach the item into the monster's body in the AR world. And hand tracking for our internal playtest, we found out the performance of the tracking is really bad and it's cost long loading time. We don't want that happen. And also, the most important part is D2 interactions is not consistent and cost more learning time for kids. So finally, we choose to use the tapping interaction for both customization and feeding. The Raycast-based tapping interaction is easy to learn for kids, easy to reuse for developer, and also ensures the consistency of interaction. Finally, we, take, we also implement the taking photos, retake, save to album features at the end of our experience. Just see how many precious moments we capture during the festivals for kids and parents with their monsters. Next. So for the art part, first of all, we, because our unique technology, we are focusing on how to uh, create a visual effect through a 3D asset to turn it into 2D uh, vision. So we even create a system to generate different uh, uh, random body to see how children's gonna uh, work when they are jello monsters. 
And as the tech grow, uh, as the tech grow, and our experience become more mature, we imp uh, improve our 3D model to a more, uh, more uh, 3D version. <laughs> And also from the 2D script we have for the mouth model, we turn that into 3D, uh, 3D as well. And to create an immersive experience, we design this uh, Dr. Jellington's, the general uh, scientist character, and also its own uh, laboratory to create different storylines. And based on the asset we have, uh, we create we can we can create hundreds of animation clips. And also, for, uh, because with our rig 3D models, we also can uh, make children have more fun time with their monsters. And lastly, let's uh, look into the production side. So we are also facing three production challenges this semester. The first is how to incorporate deep local production, production process into ETC semester project. The overall flow is actually very similar, containing uh, concepting, pre-production, production, and testing. But there is slightly uh, some differences during, the, uh, during each stages. So for example, we are asked to present our weekly progress and the pitches as a professional design agency. And we use four weeks to hold our first uh, ideation uh, concept and pitch. And also we use five weeks to um, deliver the pre-production pre stages, trying to uh, test the different technology solutions and also moving into the <clears throat> final production stages. So the milestone of stepping into the production is actually when we decide to um, migrate from the tablet to the iPhone and also upgrade our main interaction from the drag and drop to the tab. And the second one is how to manage the risks. So the first one is to identify the top risk of this project. It's actually in the pre-production side, our designers and artists is a little bit um, blocked and limited, limited by the technical feasibility. And for the tech, we actually facing a lot of uncertainty in the very beginning of this half semester. And then we um, sort of like manage this risk by three methodology. The first one is to set up some um, several rounds of the testing period and then prioritize the fundamental setbacks. And then on top of that, use the internal and external resources to manage and mit mitigate the risks. And on top of that, we're trying to anticipate the whole experience. When approaching the ending of this semester, we were actually considering whether to complete the whole experience or to increase the engagement and the belongingness of the whole experience. Um, based on our experience, we decided to add the camera features at the very, at the very ending because of the consideration of the risk. And lastly, we referring to all the metric system. On the product side is we target to build a highly reliable and uh, stability product. And also on the business side, we our main metrics is the satisfaction of the client and the faculty. And lastly, it like, looks like how our client is in, was engaged in our open house. We uh, hosted an open house at Deep Locals, um, like office last uh, last weeks, and it it's we uh, hosted around 15 employees, and they had a lot of funds. And lastly, we also had several families in the ETC festivals, and they all loved it Jello and played around with our app. And finally, last but not least, credit credit and kudos to our teams. Uh, faculty and the client. And thank you for listening to our final presentation. We are open to other questions. Hey, can you talk a little bit about the, I mean, one of the interesting things about this project is that it's a project for Deep Local, but you also have this imaginary Jello client, right? Can you talk a little bit about the complexity of wrestling with that sort of kind of unusual situation for a project? Yeah, this is a great question. So actually, uh, Jello is our pseudo client. It's client of clients. So basically, in the whole semester, we collaborated with Deep Local, which is also our both our client and uh, um, external advisor. 
among, along the whole semester. So we actually follow the whole deep local production process to learn how they uh, pitch and develop a concept to their client. So uh, one thing that you included in your uh, piece is this box that everything comes in and would be like the theoretical thing that goes out to the families. Um, and I, I found that to be really interesting, um, but I was wondering how much prototyping you may have done on what's in the box and especially on the process of creating the jello, because I, I noticed that most of your play tests, the jello was already made by the team and wanted to know what steps you took to make sure if someone got this box that they would then be able to actually create the raw material? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. I think we went through multiple tries and errors um, in making the jello, um, trying to think of what are the next steps after once you prepare the jello. And um, we've also considered like the risk and the dangers of like involve having the kid involved in with the parent and creating the jello, all those different questions. And um, definitely we've put our experience flow um, into consideration when creating um, this package design and what goes inside the package. Um. So you work with Deep Local. What was the most interesting thing you found about either their process or their relationship with you? Yeah, so um, I guess the biggest takeaway from uh, working with Deep Local is like learning their process, learning how they satisfy their client with their professional expertise. Like they all have their team and the production process is really similar with ETC. They have their engineering, uh, design, ideation artists. So how to so like uh, combine and use the whole uh, different roles of the teams to fulfill the needs of the client. It's actually, I think, the biggest takeaway from the whole semester. Um, although the, like, the Jello is not our like, actual client, but we uh, learned and we act as they are our actual client. And we presented um, very formally every week to Deep Local, just like they are our client. Thank you. Uh, hello and welcome. We are STEMspire, and this is our final presentation. Here is our team. Our faculty advisors are Mike and Ricardo, and our faculty consultant was Ruth, and our client was John Baelish. And now we'll pass it to Yu Chen to introduce our game. Yeah, thanks, Angelina. So in Power Core Value, you played as a spaceship captain, and you and your robot companion are looking for assistance with, um, with fixing the damaged spaceship. Yeah, so this is a video clip from our game. So 
we actually delivering is a role-playing game that initiates learning about racial bias for eighth graders as part of a racial bias workshop. Yeah, in our matrix are client requirements, storytelling, and playtesting. So um, based on our meetings with our client, John, the priorities of the project are the first one, do no harm, because racial bias is a really sensitive topic. And we don't want to create bias or improperly prepare students to deal with it. And the second one is empower player decisions. And the last one is be a game, because we, um, we aren't just teaching lessons, we want our players to be engaged with completing the game. And we will also continue exploring this idea more in the following presentations. And this is our process. So I'm going to talk about the character and the environment art. So in the second half of the semester, we received some comments concerning from our clients that um, the original body shape and the body languages are not that suitable for our game. So therefore, what we ended, ended up doing is keeping the two character with almost the identical experience except for the, um, the color skin. So this iteration um, also draw players' attention more towards, more leaning towards our intent. Also, we updated the equipment from the traditional engineering tools to the high-tech device. Yeah, and also you play as the player character here as shown, and we also added some animation to it. And to fill up the storyline, we added in several side NPCs, um, yes, yeah, such as a buff, and they are, they are um, interactable in the background environment. And here are some background environment that you can walk in. Yeah, and now I'm going to pass on to James to talk about the design. Thank you. Yeah, so for the game itself, we knew relatively early on that we had a few different things that we wanted to do for the game. The two key aspects of the game were the narrative, where you're able to interact with the characters through dialogue, which Angelina will go over a little bit more, um, and also a finale puzzle that you'd be able to complete that you could find relatively early, but that you were somewhat blocked from completing. So here are some initial uh, prototypes of what those might look like. Moving forward, here's what the game will look like, or looks like currently in its final state. Here's the main menu and here are the puzzles. So I'm gonna show you a quick video of what those puzzles look like in action. So those puzzles are split up into three different modules. So here they are, uh, with uh, outlined, so they're all relatively simplistic to complete in that they're just clickable and they require different interaction in general in order to actually complete them. The solutions are a little bit different and you're able to get those solutions by communicating with the character here. If you want to explore, try to figure out the solutions on your own, you're able to, but if you need additional guidance, which we wanted the players to feel like they had in the event that they wanted it but not were required to seek, then you'd be able to talk to the engineer here to get a little bit more perspective on that. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Angelina to talk a little bit more about the narrative. So for the narrative, um, our general premise is that you encounter the problem of your, of your ship gets hit by an asteroid and has taken damage. And you need to seek out expert help in order to fix it. However, you quickly run into your, our other problem. Your robot companion, or RC, is acting in a biased manner, manner towards ind purple individuals on the space station and is preventing you from being able to find the expert help you seek. You eventually do get the opportunity to separate yourself from RC. However, that brings up to this issue of whether or not you take responsibility for bringing RC onto the space station and enabling uh, its racially biased actions, or do you pass off all the blame onto RC itself? Uh, once again, you have another opportunity to take responsibility. However, we don't want our uh, narrative to be solely conveyed through dialogue. We also want to build it into the environment. So for example, um, in these posters and signs seen here, Additionally, we can reference our environmental components in our side dialogue. So for example, we have uh, this poster for this Galactic Center tech as 
uh, educational institute, and below we have two side NPCs who can be clicked on and have a conversation um, concerning this poster. In this particular case, we have a purple parent and a pink parent um, who are seated in the same area and are presumably of a similar socioeconomic class. However, we can see that the purple parent has far worse outcomes um, in comparison to the pink parent. So now I want to pass on to Phoebe to talk about the tech. Uh, thank you, Angelina. And I'll now talking about the implementation. And our game is built using Unity and is now published in, onto an ET server with the link above. And when we publish our game, we actually face a, an, a tech challenge. Um, at first, we published into an itch.io. However, when we went to the school to do play test, it was actually blocked by the school computer. So therefore, we have to publish onto a dedicated website on the ETC server. Uh, as mentioned in the half that we, uh, this game will be evaluated by a research team after this semester. So we will have to record the user behavior. And different from what we are doing in the half that we store the data into a JSON file, we're now using the Unity Analytic because there's more um, visualization functions for uh, the, the researchers to explore. And we also use it in our um, game. And I will show a couple of examples. Um, in this example, we can see the time spent on the individual dialogues, and we can use it to analyze the player behavior, like um, are the players spending enough time on the dialogue that covers the racial bias? And this is another example uh, that we can see the comparison of specific dialogue choice. And we found an interesting result in the conversation that the player has to choose it's RC's fault or it's our fault. And in the results, the eighth grader will choose it was RC's fault, whereas the educators, the adults, they would choose it was our fault to take the responsibility. So based on this result, we actually added into our discussion point in the teaching guide that we provide. And this will be mentioned it later. And now I'll pass back to James to talk about playtest. So again, one of our key aspects of our project was actually going to be playtesting. So we are not indicative of our audience, our audience being eighth graders. None of us developers are indeed eighth graders. So it was really important for us to actually be able to test with them to get their feedback and make sure our messages were landing. So playtest day was one of our important milestones where we were able to test with eighth graders. And one of the important things that we had found at that checkpoint was that although we had intended for RC to be seen as relatively biased, at that point, RC was seen as pretty trustworthy. And we wanted to make sure that that message was not what we were communicating. Communicating. So moving forward, another important play test for us was at Northgate. So this was at a school district that we were actually able to play test directly with these eighth graders. We were able to play test our game as well as run some of the activities that would take place at a later workshop um, that would be done right after the game was played. But we'll get to that in a little bit as well. Um, one of the activities that we were able to do with them was this engineer folding activity. So the way it works in general is we would have cutouts of these engineers that we would give to each individual student. We would then describe situations within the game that these characters may find hurtful. So for example, a particular situation where RC had been racially biased or possibly some other situation that we would describe. And then each student would fold their engineer depending on how they felt that character was hurt. What we found in general from this activity was that players, students reacted to this relatively differently. It was not a uniform experience. Not every engineer was folded in the same way or the same number of times. And we really wanted to make sure that we were reintegrating this information, the fact that this experience became unique, back into our game. We were also able to play test not just with students, but also with educators. So at Northgate, at a, a separate date from the previous play test, we were able to discuss with teachers and educators locally about ways that they would want to sort of teach the information that we were providing. So we had set up for the play test to be done for, again, these eighth graders. And then the lesson would be presented afterwards by these educators. And so we wanted to work on what actually we were presenting. So that the game itself did not feel necessarily standalone, and the workshop was just kind of a lesson that they had developed completely independently of that. We had developed our teaching guide, which would be seen as an interface that they'd be able to plan their lessons through the workshop. So I'm going to hand it over to Hannah to talk about that now. Um, so as James mentioned, we ran an educator workshop in order to talk about what might be in the workshop that was actually presented to the students. Um, as we heard the discussions and all of the great approaches, that we made the decision to leave the workshop up to the teacher. 
um, the content. But in order to help the teachers create the content, we decided to give them a resource that could provide ideas and give some examples from what we had, from some of the amazing stuff that we had gotten from the educators workshop. So um, th because of this, we ended up creating the teacher's guide um, to include some of the ideas from the workshop and some of the ideas we had planned. Um, here are some of the educators that participated in the workshop. Big thanks to them. Um, and the main section of the teaching guide is as follows. There, we have the introduction, project aspirations, which is where we talk about the specific lessons we hope the students will take away from our game. Uh, game information, workshop information, which consists of several subcategories that will be discussed in the following slides, and additional resources. As mentioned earlier, we have specific lessons that the students, we want the students to take away from our game. On the PowerPoint are two of the ones that are specifically listed in our teacher guide, but there are more in there as well. Um, and although we ultimately have the format of the workshop up to the facilitator, we do have an order of events that we believe is most effective in use with the game and the way it was designed. So in order to make the most of the head fake, we suggest that the teacher format the workshop in the following way. They, give, they can give a short one to two sentence introduction. Um, in the discovery path, which is the rec path we recommend, that they will introduce the game as a problem solving game, similar to the way the, it, we introduced our project here. Um, then the students will play the game, and then finally the teachers will give the workshop they created and reveal that it's actually about racial bias. Uh, so we provide the teachers with two activi example activities that could be used during the workshop. One is the folding activity that James covered earlier, and the other is uh, under the suit, which is an activity that was actually came from the educator workshop. Um, so in this activity, the students are giving a coloring page, which is provided in the teaching guide, um, of the captain and asked to draw what they think the captain looks like under the suit. Um, after they're done, the students then show the captain to the class and a discussion follows about how the story would change based on what color the captain was. Uh, finally, we have the discussion section, which is where we provide teachers with potential subjects to bring up in the class discussion. One of our favorite um, discussion points, which came up from the, um, from the educators workshop, was who or what is the RC in your life? Um, as for access, both the teaching guide and the game are ac accessible via our project website, and I will turn it over to James to finish it up. Thanks, Anna. So again, what all are we delivering? So we're delivering our game, which itself is a playable game, but it has access to these analytics that can be gathered based on player choice. We're delivering a teaching guide that will walk through ways that the students and the teachers can interface with our game. And we are providing some knowledge about how this workshop is going to be run, although we ourselves, the team, are not running that workshop. That will be the teachers. So at this time, we'd like to thank all of our advisors, all faculty, and everyone overall who has play tested or given feedback to the game. It wouldn't be here without you. And I'd like to open up now for questions. Hey, um, in your presentation a few times you mentioned kind of skin tone and color as the main ways you're thinking about presenting race, but obviously that like race and ethnicity can be projected onto all kinds of different kinds of features and activities and behaviors and so on. Are there, did you talk about that and with the teachers and they decided that they wanted to focus on kind of skin tone as like the main thing or how did you come to those conclusions, yeah? Yeah, so that was initially something that was based on the seeding of this project. So it had existed prior to the semester as a paper, as essentially a proof of concept of how beneficial could a game be versus a traditional lesson plan. And one of the key ideas linked there was for specifically looking at African Americans as a marginalized group. And so as we started getting more and more specific, we thought about 
uh, talking about it in a variety of different ways. And one of the ways that specifically the art had changed throughout time was that as opposed to trying to talk about gender or trying to talk about other things that are certainly existing senses of bias in the real world that we aren't necessarily able to cover in the span of one semester, that skin color was sort of the thing of, okay, this is what we're trying to talk about overall while trying to not necessarily touch on these other areas that are extremely important but are not necessarily met within the scope of this project specifically. Sure. So, so you mean more aspects of like culture or, or specifically like... Yeah, that, that was another thing. So again, I guess going back in general to the characters, um, we had originally done more about... Uh, we had more varied character designs. We had originally taken aspects that we thought were more um, like related or more personalized to specific um, races, that sort of thing, but we didn't want to feel like we were characterizing everything, um, which was something that we wanted to be very clear of and was one of our goals with the do no harm aspect. We didn't want it to just feel like, oh, this character, well, they're, you know, larger or something like that, so it's, it's a body weight thing. And so as we iterated, we kept getting feedback from a lot of our advisory that it made more sense to make them almost identical, um, except for skin color specifically. And that's one of the reasons that we stuck to kind of an idea of more like, non-human, like they're humanoid, but they're not quite humans because we wanted to make sure that we weren't looking at it directly through the context of these are actually people, you would find them in our world. So ideally they're humanoid and we can think about them as people, but not quite necessarily as just humans. I'm curious in the game design of this, how much the idea of having to do a workshop influenced the design? Did you specifically design moments in for prompting and for discussion, or did you find that the workshop sort of just followed as a, an, a thing after sort of like the design had been iterated? So we, okay. so we came into this knowing that it would be a workshop, and because of this, we actually were, our focus for the game was less on, you know, outright stating stuff about racial bias and more on kind of threads of racial bias that could be put in there purposefully and then pulled out by the teachers in order to work in this workshop. The idea being that they, the children would be more willing to learn the lesson if they didn't know that they were learning a lesson. And so, yeah, we ended up, we in fact have a whole section of the teacher's guide that points out specific areas that they could, that we specifically inserted racial bias instances in that could be used as examples, like in the, like the posters and stuff like that, so that the teachers can pull out stuff like this, like the 100 greatest innovators are all pink, to have it, that as an example of like representation, representational bias. If you don't see someone who looks like you, you aren't gonna be able to, or you are less likely to believe you can go into the field. So um, kind of, yeah, just like, we made it a lot subtler because we knew that there was gonna be a workshop there and we believed that having a more subtle game would enable the children to be more willing to learn afterwards because hopefully they'll notice, hey, something's not right here, and then they'll be willing to be, oh, this is why it's not right in the workshop. Whereas if they came up with it, it was, or came into it knowing it, they'd be like, oh, why do I wanna learn? <laughs> And that's something we found with a lot of our playtesting as well, is because of the way we had presented it, a lot of the students sort of initiated these ideas of why is this like this, or why is this character being a particular way, which we found to be a great starting point as compared to a traditional lesson structure of, hey, here's what's important, and the teacher is communicating that information directly to the student. The student being able to bring up, you know, this felt weird, or what's going on here, then starts the conversation where the teacher is able to bounce back off of it, and we found that to overall be a lot more productive. So when we were at 
Northgate, that was something that a lot of students were verbally communicating with us, essentially out loud saying, oh, I understand the situation or something's going on here, but I don't necessarily know what it is because I might not have the language to actually talk about it yet. All right. Um, morning, guys. Uh, we are Team Rain Gardeners, and uh, we did a AR um, educational experience. So this is our team. Uh, I'm Alexa, the producer and UI UX designer, and also we have Leah, um, our UI UX designer and artist, and Alisa and Harlan, our our programmers. Uh, and our client is the uh, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. So they protect and restore uh, exceptional places to provide our region uh, with uh, like clean water, wildlife, and natural area for the benefits of present and gen gener uh, future generations. And uh, so they built a lot of rain garden in Pittsburgh. There's one rain garden in Shadyside. Um, the rain garden is a type of water captures features uh, in landscaping that helps slow and absorb runoff from storms. And next to the rain garden, there's an elementary school called Lincoln School. So our client want us uh, to build an experience that helps the school um, better um, exploring the garden. And we also work closely with the um, STEM educators and also students in the school uh, and communicate with them to better understand their needs. So overall, our target user is the STEM teacher and educators and third, and third to fifth grade students at Lincoln School. And uh, we will build two independent AR applications on Android tablet. So um, this is our design goal. Our design goal is to support teaching experience for educators in Lincoln Elementary School, and it include how the rain garden work, and also how the plants and animals uh, benefit from the whole worker cycle and ecology. Um, to reach out the design goal, we um, held multiple tasks this semester. Uh, we did two before half, and for after half. Though this, we um, like were able to get feedbacks from uh, our client, the, pens uh, the conservancy, and also the educators and students at Lincoln School. So uh, those feedbacks were driven factors for us to create a better experience, which we will um, talk uh, in detail later. And those, uh, we decided to design two independent uh, application or experience. So the first one is an on-site experience. And uh, it will uh, locate at the rain garden. And it is focused more on the whole uh, water cycle and also show different season uh, in garden like summer and rain. And um, the in there's another one is an indoor cart ex experience. That one is much more focused on the each component of of the ring garden, and it can play it everywhere. Normally, it's just in classroom. I'll pass to Harlan to talk about the indoor, uh, the on-site one. Thanks, Alexa. Um, so I'll talk about our on-site experience. Um, so this is our initial concept. Um, users can stand at a designated spot to see the virtual ring garden through the tablet, and we use CMU Natural History Museum as the reference. 
Um, here's the user flow. So user first scan the sign, and after they interact with the rain garden, they can pass the hand over the tablet to other users, and then they can move to another spot. We have a trailer video to show later. Um, we, ha we set up three signs at the rain garden, so we have three different spots so that teachers can split students into different groups, and we also try to prevent kids fall into the rain garden when they are using the tablet. Um, so we set up three signs for temporary using, and our client conservancy, they will build up, build up their own version and set up them later. Uh, we also include the distance measurement and sign specification in our manual documentation. So we try to utilize the magic of AR technology to illustrate the rain garden in different seasons so that our users can experience them all at once. Um, we also want to users to experience the ecosystem of the rain garden. So for summer session, user can see uh, pollinators and flowers, and for rain session, user can see how rain garden can prevent flooding, and for winter session, user, user can explore and see how rain garden can be sheltered and pre pro provide foods for some species during the winter. And uh, Leah will talk about on-site art. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about the art process. So we got a list of models from our client before we start making objects. And then we created low poly models and animations. And the reason why it's low poly is that one, it is better supported in AR environment. And two, figurative approach can explain the concept better for elementary kids. So we, after we made those models, we imported things to Unity. And this is what the summer season looks like with flowers and animals. And this is a close up view. And this will reappear in the demo video that we will share shortly. And this is a rainy season, so we added rain particles and rain water movement. And snow se winter season with snow particles. Now I'm gonna talk about some feedback that we got and how we implemented it. So we got some feedback in half, quarter, soft, and through play tests. And one of the feedback we got was how might we make this more stud student-driven activity. So the initial idea was it was for educators to lead the students by showing tablets around. But a lot of faculties mentioned that it might be even more interesting if students can use the tablet by themselves and explore. So how we designed the app is students can actively participate in this app and read more information about it. Another feedback we got was how might we make this more engaging than just a mere observation. So we gamified the experience. So as you can see on the screen, we have those coin looking like clickable elements so that it feels more like a game for students to find different objects in the rain garden. Um, these are some of the supplementary elements for gamif gamify, enhancing the gamifying experience. We will also explain this in the demo video, but we have like tutorial screens for gestures, icons, and info panels. Another feedback we got was that how might we reduce the ambiguity of the figurative low poly representation. Um, so we decided to add some arrows and text in to supplement and explain things better. And for the um, tech challenges, we are experiencing pretty bad glitching and frozen at the early developing stage and also doing some play testing. So we solved this problem by changing the way how we compile the scripts uh, and also we switched to a different architecture. Uh, we also use a supporting application to rate the quality of reference images. So with the higher score, it is more likely to be recognized by our application. And so those three images are our final design for the science. And those are the effort we made to create a better recognizable images. So here's the demo. Like when users scan the sign, uh, after the instruction, they can interact with the rain garden model. So they can swipe to rotate or pinch to change the scale. And for each session, we provide three different clickable items. We want a user to ex explore the rain garden to find them all. Uh, when they click items, they can see the information that are related to the rain garden. And you can see this is how our virtual rain garden align with the real rain garden. So we have three sessions experience. We want the users to feel like they don't have to wait until rain or winter to see how rain garden looks like. They can just use our app to experience whenever they want. And next, Alisa will talk about indoor experience. Thank you, Harden. So as an educational tool, we also designed an indoor AR card game as a supplement to daily teaching. So the educators will be using it in class when students are not able to step in the rain garden themselves physically. 
So uh, we have been talking about this, like our design ideas and concepts uh, during half. So I will be mainly talking about how we made changes after that. So as a recap, we were initially uh, inspired by an AR chemistry game and uh, we will use it to introduce the rain gardens. So for the experience, we will be providing a set of cars and also the rain garden map. The students can put the cars on the map and uh, view through the tablet to see the beautiful animations and models. And and during that process, they will learn about the components in the rain garden and how they can function together to benefit the environment. So for the tech part, we are using AR Foundation and AR Core in Unity. And to implement the card functions, we are using the image recognition function built in the library. Now Leah will talk about the indoor art part. So we designed this map image for students to place cards on top of it. And then these are the list of cards. So we have two animal cards, four plant cards, two environment cards, and five quiz cards. So when they place the cards on it and scan using the tablet, they can see those 3D animations. We will also show them in the demo video again. So we can compare the pollinator, non-pollinator, deep root, short root, and how water flows in the garden. Okay. Um, so during the development process, we kept collecting feedback from the playtestings and also ETC faculties. So the most common question we get is that how we can make sure the students are learning, how we can measure the teaching value of the experience. So we added five quiz questions that they will be answering after the experience. And the questions will cover the plants, animals, and the function structures in the rain garden. We were happy to see that most students were able to answer them correctly, which we will be seeing like in the end of the play testing video. And also during half of the semester, we were expected to add more variety to the gameplay. So we added the cards from 5 to 13, and the students reported that to be a quite moderate number of for 20 to 13 minutes experience. And lastly, we should be responsible for the accuracy of the information we are delivering. So we added the info panel for each component, and by clicking on the model, they are able to read through the information, and we see students having discussions in the group and reading them aloud to everyone. Now I will pass it to Leah to talk about our conclusions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we, this is the demo video of our indoor product. So we can see the students can view through the tablet to see the models. And when we put a plant card and an animal card together, we can see how they interact with each other, whether it's attracted to the flower or not. And we can view the model from all kinds of angles and click on it to read the info panel. This is an example of the quiz card. So the students can read the quiz question and get feedbacks when they click on the answers. Now I will pass it to Leah to talk about our conclusions. Um, for, for conclusion, I'm going to talk about matrix metrics and playtesting. So these are some of the matrix metrics that we set up during half. If you're meeting client requirements, creating interactive prototypes, um, if it is supplemental educational experience, and if you're having enough play tests. And we are now going to show this video to show that uh, we have met the success rate metrics. What did you want to say? Oh. Yeah. Well, that's mine. Yeah. I want to see it. It looks like Yeah, Okay, it says bleed, bleed, and, uh, do not allow rain water to. Careful, guys. This one is the same thing. That's false, Fred. What? You want to play it? Today we have rain coming down now, and we couldn't get outside, but we were still able to visit it, weren't we? 
And I think that's very powerful. If we can bring those things, if we can bring that into the classroom using technology, I think it's super because it gives us so much more flexibility. Um, there will probably be times when we can do work and hear new designs or, or do things to help with our partners at the Conservancy where we can actually work even if we can't get outside. We probably will be able to do some more effective planning in the springtime and things like that. So I think the learning is going to be tremendous. How many people feel like they learned something? That's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you feel like you learned something, and, that, and that's awesome. That's really what it's supposed to do. So last but not least, I'm going to talk about the deliverables. So we have two apps, uh, one indoor app and one for outdoor. And we have the user manual for the ETC faculty and for our clients to like print out cars, make wooden sign, and access the Unity files and things like that. And also one sheet instruction for educators. And lastly, the blog that we kept on for 15 weeks. So thank you so much. And now we are open to questions. I was curious, why did you use Cinema 4D instead of Maya? Oh, it was a tool that I was most proficient with. So I imported the FBX file into Unity, so like it doesn't matter what the modeling tool that I used. Thank you. Okay, so I had a question about um, what kind of thinking went into designating your like on-site outdoor areas as secret zones. Um, I noticed that they are called secret zones. All of your signage says secret zones, but the, the purpose of your project is to demystify the rain garden for the students. Whose idea was it to call them secret zones and why? Yeah, that's actually my idea. Yeah, because like there will be some like public people pass by, and so we will call it, call it like secret zone only for like the uh, like the elementary school students, and also if the uh, conservancy wanna make it a public one, they can add a QR code and so that like, you know, public people can scan the QR code to like explore the secret zone. So we just call it secret zone. Yeah, and also actually we are unlocking different seasons that you are not able to see at the current time. So it's kind of secret when you can see the winter session, like how the rain gonna looks in winter when it's actually in summer. So that's why we call it kind of unlocking the secret zones. Uh, and it, we also try to like gamify the whole experience by like raising curiosity from the kids. Um, yeah, what was the largest insight that informed your design? For both indoor and outdoor? Sure. Um, so our main, like for when we first started, our intention was to teach about the rain garden and how it works behind it. But we also learned from our play test that students were learning what technology can do. So like students are not only learning the science behind it, but also were very interested in what we were doing, asked the questions about what AR is, how what AR can do, and how do we build it, how long did it take for us to build it. So that were some of the insights that we got that was interesting. I don't know if I answered your question, but All right, thank you. Hello everyone, we are Team Small Lab Flare and welcome to our final presentation. I'm Tyron, this is Tenvi, Valerie, and Yifan, and our instructors are John and Scott. About, about our clients, our, our clients are, uh, are high school students and middle school students from the Northgate School District. 
a quick recap of our project overview. We, we successfully built three prototypes. They are all interactive experience. Um, they are virtual children, um, let it out, and also conquer the grid, which all serves the same goal, which is um, raise awareness about mental health issues, prepare the students with uh, knowledge about how, how, about how to deal with day-to-day -day emotions, and also facilitate the conversations. There are also miscellaneous um, documentation output, including game design documents, and also technical documents, and also a, a menu for the students to orchestr orchestrate the game while the students are playing. So, through, th through back to the process to, to, to halves. Um, we, to, frankly speaking, we made decent um, progress until that time. We did several site visits to meet the kids to do play tests and collect data. And also, during the half presentation, we received tons of constructive feedbacks from, from the faculty. And we treasure all kinds of uh, fee feedbacks and serve them as our um, guidance for future polishment. So, a quick recap of our prototypes. For prototype one, we, su we successfully themed our theme it to be a virtual um, experience, uh, more specifically, a virtual pond where students can uh, interact with the environmental object like lotus, lily pad, listen to some chill music, and also um, escape from the reality for a bit. But um, their feedbacks includes that uh, the limitation and visuals are not abundant enough at that stage, and also adding more guidance to the game could be so helpful. For the second prototype, we develop a collaborative game that uh, try to convey the idea of uh, how to deal with negative emotions um, by using an analogy that concretized uh, um, different emotions into different orbs. Their feedbacks um, include like, um, the, uh, uh, the emotional orbs are not quite unique, and it's really hard to distinguish uh, which um, emotion that orbs is representing. And also the scene could be really chaotic at that stage, which uh, actually inflicting more um, stress to the, to the player, which is not a desirable outcome we want to see. And also, last but not least, for the third prototype, we had no idea what it should be at that stage, which is our major concern. Now I would like to hand the mic to my teammates to let them elaborate more on, our, on each prototype. Thanks, Taryn. The first prototype we developed is called Virtual Children. It is an immersive experience that is art intensive that allows one to three students to uh, focus on the moment and to explore the art and music and showing. Uh, the idea was first inspired by our first tour to the chill room at Northgate School District, a space where students can come when they feel overwhelmed or stressed or anx anxious and hoping to find a space to chill in. Um, we successfully utilized the features of Small Lab and, we, uh, and created this immersive Safe experience. We integrated powerful lighting effect, uh, soothing music, and engaging movements into this immersive environment that we want students to focus on the uh, present and without thinking too much about the goal and the purpose of this experience. Compared with the halves, we now have a more powerful environment of the floating flowers, lily pads, and uh, different interactions that students can try and have fun with. Uh, we also included, uh, we also added the feedback when the students interact with the object. We now have more interactions, and we also explored different sound effects and background music. We also introduced an Easter egg when the, all of the three ones, all of the players come very close to each other. We have conducted many rounds of playtests, and according to our playtest feedback, we found that people differ a lot more than we expect. We can take a look at two different age groups playing the same prototype, and we found that the younger group, uh, they tend to be more active and energetic in the space, while the older, while the older uh, age groups tend to be more observant in the environment. But the features of our prototype work, work pretty well in both groups. And uh, most people appreciate the art and music of our uh, experience. Some people mentioned that uh, doing nothing, just staying in the space, makes them feel pretty good. And people like the visuals uh, and the calming music. 
Uh, but we also received some doubts and questions about this game being no competitive and no purpose and no goal. But we don't want to uh, give very clear instructions to students to tell them what to do and what to expect to see in our, uh, in, in our experience. We wanted them to explore by themselves. Uh, but based on all the feedbacks we introduced, uh, we developed a new um, introductory pitch that, um, ver that is very clear and, and concise and will help onboard students to our experience. And for the next prototype, uh, I will hand it off to Valerie to talk about it. Thank you, Yifan. So the next prototype we made is called Let It Out. It is a cooperative game which our purpose is try to uh, encourage students to work together and talk to each other and then discuss uh, the strategies during their play. At the same time, we want them to connect their feelings and also try to learn how to deal with their daily emotional issues. Uh, the, the, the second prototype we may have two parts. The first is the tutorial and then comes up with the, the game. So during the tutorial, we want to express some messages to the players. The first message is they are playing the role of the three emotional managers. And the second thing is they uh, try to express their emotions out of the door in the game. And then the third one is different emotions could interact with each other and how the game works. So the game actually make an, uh, ask the three players to make a net to capture the emotional balls. And then they push the balls out of the door, like, like, like the picture shows. And then the uh, therapist could control like when and how the emotional balls comes up. So here is the emotional balls interaction design, which we have four emotional balls uh, show, show on the screen, which we have sadness, anger, joy, and depression. So we actually send a lot of survey to the students and also the therapist and try to connect the, the shape and the colors with the, with the, uh, the, the final sphere we made. And then here we have the, our final design like this. So now we, I want to show a quick demo how this game actually works. So as you can see, the white dot is actually three players. Uh, they are trying to make a net to capture all the emotional balls. And then the joy uh, emotion balls can interact with the larger anger to try to reduce the size of the anger so that they can make the anger to be smaller and then uh, push, push all the emotional balls out of the door. Uh, during the play test, we kind of realize what we designed really well and what can we improve. So the first thing is we actually tell a metaphor story successfully uh, and then we, the emotional balls could be controlled and managed by a therapist, which it can be a learned process for the therapist and also for the players. And then we achieve the goal, which is uh, players talk a lot and they work together during the, the whole uh, playing process. So what we, what could have been improved, which is we can make a certain game modes for the therapist so that, so that they don't have to actually control how many uh, numbers the emotion boss comes up. And then the third thing is we think we can add some challenges and tasks for the players to play for making this game more playable and more, more enjoyable. And next, I will, I will pass to Tavi to talk about the third prototype. Thank you, Valerie. So for our third and final prototype, we went with Conquer the Grid. The inspiration of this prototype actually came from overhearing students' conversations as they play tested our first two prototypes, and their absolute need to make every experience competitive in some way or the other, whether that was the purpose or not. So we thought, instead of shying away from this idea of competition, we would introduce a more fun way of competing for students, where they could have fun in the space rather than be stressed about the other things in their school life. So the final game design of this was essentially it started with a 30 second tutorial after which the students could go in the space and their wands would be able to color the different squares in the grid. At the end of 90 seconds, the student who had most squares colored would win the game. To demo this further, each dot over here represents a player in the space. Each player can go around the square as you can see and there's a UI that loads the square, where, which makes the student stay in the square for at least one second before they color it. The student can either conquer other pers uh, another person's square or they can color the white squares. 
And at the end of 90 seconds, the one who has the most squares at that moment wins the game. So after playtesting various iterations of this game with the students, we came up with three major successes of this prototype. The first being the level of competition that we achieved in this prototype. The level of competition was neither too much, where it would stress the students out and not want them to go back and play this game, nor was it too less, where the students got bored. And that brings me to the second point of success, which was replayability. We found that the students wanted to go in uh, and play the game again for various reasons, whether it was to try a different strategy they thought of or to compete with other people and see if they could beat them. The third and most important point of success for us was the students' attention. On asking the therapists about their observations of the students while they were playing this game, we found that the therapists saw that the students were more focused on the competition, and hence they were momentarily distracted from all other stresses in their life. And this felt like a major point of success and kind of the intention of our prototype. We also had a few concerns and challenges. Uh, one concern that was brought up during softs by faculty as well as students was in-game feedback. Students seemed a little confused as to why uh, there was negative feedback in the game and why the squares were disappearing. To counter that, uh, during festival we did add some negative and positive audio feedback that did counter this to a huge extent. However, there was still a little, uh, considering the many sounds that are being played at the same time, there was still a little concern regarding that. The second part was competition. Though we play tested this game with a variety of students and a great mix of students, we do acknowledge that competition, even at the most basic level, can be a point of stress for some students. And so we do list it as a concern. However, throughout our play tests over the semester, we did not encounter that within our sample space. Um, third is tracking. This is more of a technology point. Um, there were da days where the tracking was flawless, and on those days, the, this game was not frustrating to play. However, there were days where the tracking was extremely laggy, and that was especially frustrating while playing this prototype. So that is a challenge that we have been facing over the semester. So having built three different prototypes, uh, sending three different messages to the students, we looked back at things we could have done better. And number one was the amount of playtesting versus the iteration rate that we had over the semester. To recap, we visited Northgate School, which was our client, every week, and we playtested our current versions of our prototype, as well as sent out surveys if we were not visiting. Um, on top of that, we participated in playtest days, softs, and even invited the students to the EDC. As a combination of all of this feedback versus the iteration we were able to achieve on a weekly basis, we could have organized our playtests better earlier in the semester in order to achieve the best output at the end. Towards the end of the semester, we did put a full stop and organize it better, but we could have done that earlier. The second part is the platform we were working with. Uh, the platform came with its own limitations, which we acknowledged during halves, and some of which we integrated into our prototypes as challenges, such as the shadow problem. Um, tracking, as I mentioned before, persisted to be a problem, but came out more as a problem in some prototypes rather than others. And the third was dealing with technology in general. So the picture over here is us trying to build a physical prototype to replace our digital one in case our digital one did not work during playtest day. And uh, several times during the semester, we did face this problem of having to have a plan B for our um, prototype. There was a concern raised during halves that, uh, to how to measure the success of our project at the end. Uh, towards the end of the semester, we sent out surveys, anonymous surveys to the students and the therapists, essentially measuring uh, features and playability success, as well as their feelings and conversations during the experience as a factor of success for, uh, from the students. But from the therapists, we observed more from the fact-checking point of view and their observations while they watched the students play. And as a combination of these two, we had guided the iterations of each prototype throughout the semester. And also, our final surveys showed that each prototype sort of sent the message which we were hoping for. So in conclusion, we built three prototypes, first being a stress-free experience with no goal, second, a more educational and teamwork-focused experience, and third, a more competitive and fun experience, immersing the students in the space completely. Uh, adding to this, we provided game design documentation, technical documentation, as well as a teacher's manual, so the therapist can facilitate all these experiences in the classroom environment. That was our semester. Thank you so much, and we are open for questions.
Uh, so your overall goal was about engaging in these conversations about mental health, and I'm really curious, especially with your last prototype being more directed at just sort of an engaging activity, where would you advise someone developing these to put their attention? Um, would it be more directed at you know, transformational ideas in mental health, or would you push more towards just being an engaging experience in a place to escape? Um, I think it was like a part of both. So we built more towards an engaging experience for people to be stress-free, mostly because um, this will be in a classroom environment around a lot of people. So we could not address extremely serious subject matter regarding mental health, which is why all three prototypes, as you can see, were very um, base level, but engaging and fun. So we focused more on that part while making one of our prototypes a little educational. Thank you. Well, one thing I noticed about your designs is um, visually they stand out as being kind of different. And I was wondering if there was a design choice be behind having them see like kind of three separate disconnect, more disconnected experiences rather than having sort of a unified feel and having like three different flavors of the experience, if that makes sense. Um, does that make sense as a question? Okay. Um, so actually, when we set out to make these three prototypes, uh, the deliverable was make three prototypes. So we tried to categorize them as completely different sort of messages that we were trying to send. So we didn't actually want the students to relate all three. They should be independent experiences that they can play, uh, especially the first one where we would want the students to just walk in any time and be able to play it. So uh, our design choices were deliberately separate. Yeah, thank you.